he went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of God stood before them, and the glory of God shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom God favors. And so we have to ask ourselves, what does the Christmas story really mean to us? Now, in modern Christianity, with all the historical evidences that have been discovered here in the last 40, 50 years, especially the last, well, last 150 years, especially the last 40, 50 years, uh, there is now a revelation of the origin of the Christmas story, which is what we just read, that has come forth, is being shared both by the more literalist Christians and even those who are more open to different interpretations. And uh, so there is a common thread that is now being revealed, and that is the Christmas story wasn't celebrated by first century Christians. And in fact, uh, if you go back to the Judaic traditions, and uh, you can look this up for yourself, it's uh, simply to remember.com. It's uh, Judaism, Judaism Online, and they have a, uh, the history of Christmas on here. They've got it, I printed it out. So you're going to get uh, a little bit perspective here, both sides of the street. We've got the origins of Christianity, the story of Christians, and you've got the American Indian interpretation of Christmas. And I know that there are many people who struggle with believing in Christianity because, especially among uh, uh, disillusioned Euro-Americans, and, and American Indians, to some degree, who uh, say, well, it's all lies, it's all made up, it's all about power and control and manipulation. And, and I respect people's right to believe that, especially when they've been victimized in so many different ways by exploitive and oppressive Christians who use the name of God for their own personal gain. Uh, but there is another perspective that we can consider that might be happening here. More about a perspective from God, God's point of view. And so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit this morning here. And in this history of Christmas, well, the first challenge we run into, according to uh, uh, Lawrence uh, Kellerman, is that the historical representations portrayed here in Luke chapter 2 and in other, other verses here are not consistent with the historical fact. Uh, starting with the birth of Christ. Now, pretty much everybody agrees nowadays that Christ was not born on December 25th. And the historical record actually, because you can look at the genealogy of the Judaic peoples, they're very, very good at keeping their gene, you know, genealogical records. Uh, 
you know, there's a time frame in relation to John the Baptist and the birth of, of Jesus that puts a more realistic uh, time of the birth of Jesus to be in the month of September. It would actually make him, I believe, an Aquarius. So, go figure. But John the Baptist was born in March. That we know from the historical record. I was born in March. So, there you go. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, so John the Baptist and I have a lot in common. That's pretty cool. Anyhow, uh, so that gives us a pretty good idea of when, but we also know from the emperor records, from the Roman records, of who was in charge at when time of year and how that translates into the Gregorian calendar. They don't quite line up. So, yeah, did Luke and the writers of Luke extrapolate? Well, obviously. But they sure told a good story. And the story, the intent, the purpose of the story was to not so much be historically accurate as was to instill in the people a sense of understanding the relationship that Jesus had with God and the relationship that we should be having with Jesus. And when you think about it from that perspective, and you think about perhaps the story was inspired of God maybe a little bit, then you get a better understanding of why the story was written the way it was, and not so much about being concerned about historical accuracy, because you got to keep in mind in first century Palestine, historically accuracy was not of that great significance. So, let's look into that a little bit. So when we look at uh, even more beyond that time of Esau's birth, we, we also have to keep in mind that, you know, according to the Jewish tradition, nobody really cared when you were born. It just never occurred to them to celebrate a person's birth, you know. Uh, the Jewish people weren't, weren't into celebrating birthdays, they were into celebrating Occasion, special occasions designated by God and also uh, honoring people for their deeds and not for the fact that they were born. And that's what we remember when we talk about historical figures, Odysseus, Hercules, on and on and on, you know, David, Solomon, Jesus, even in among our Indian religious tradition, you know, the Pale One, many others. We don't think about the day that they were born. We remember them for what they have done, who they were. And so that's what we think about when we think about the Christmas story, who Jesus was and what he did. And that is consistent with, you know, looking at how Christmas came to power. Now, Romans weren't exactly the nice people for a lot of reasons. Yeah, but one of the things that they did in their, their uh, the Roman religious tradition is uh, they've got the name of the festival uh, that was celebrated here. Yeah, uh, let's see here. The name of this festival Saturnalia Festival. So it's a Saturnalia Festival that was done the week leading up to December 25th. And this was a Roman festival. And it was basically a license during that week to do anything you want, anything went. All the people who have been living by the rules and regulations, doing the law and order thing all year long, at the end of the year, they had one week to go crazy. Anything was legal. 
rape, pillaging, uh, torture, abuse, whatever anybody could get away with, they could do. And they did. And at the end of that, at the Saturnella Festival, on the 25th day of December, the Roman guards would take one person, each community had one male and one or one female that was chosen at the beginning of the week, an innocent, who was the subject of all kinds of abuses and victimizations. They bore the, the symbol of being the, the living presence of evil in the community. And on that 25th day of December, these people were brutally beaten to death. And it was supposed to reflect putting an end to evil for that year within the community. And that's what they did. That's what the Romans did. One of the many things that made them not quite so popular was the general population. And so uh, this is a historical fact. We know this to be true. When the Catholic Church got involved in being the, uh, the official religion of the Roman Empire, they tried to make some changes. And the only way for, that they could uh, put an end to the Saturnella Festival was to enculturate it into Christian theology and teachings. So they basically they took this Christian tradition and made it into, a, or this uh, pagan tradition, if you want to use that term, made it into a Christian tradition and it took a while. They had, they basically, the popes gave free will, free license to a lot of stuff. One of the more popular things to do in the Saturnella festivals for people to run naked through the streets singing. But guess where Christmas caroling came from? And uh, uh, that's what they did. And, the, and so in order to help facilitate the transition, the pope and several popes actually, had the great idea that wouldn't it be fun if we made the Jews run naked through the streets singing on December 25th while all the other people were doing proper Christian stuff. You know, celebrating Christmas in the proper Christian tradition. And that's what they did year after year, and they would dress the rabbis up in clown suits and make them parade through the streets, uh, basically denigrating the Jewish people. And this went on for a very long time, until finally it was put to an end. And that's the origins of the Christmas story in that respect, and, and Santa Claus is a whole different ballgame. Santa Claus got involved uh, based on St. Nicholas, and St. Nicholas actually was a Turkish Christian born in the second century who wasn't canonized until the 19th century. And, uh, and he, was, he, he was the original St. Nick, that's what he did. He gave toys to the kids. And there's also a group of women who did that also, uh, pagan women, and so in order for Christians to assimilate that, they turned it into St. Nicholas also uh, bestowing the toys on the kids. And these, uh, these, these uh, pagan women were, were giving out toys during the Saturnella Festival to the kids. And so they, uh, there was a lot going on back then. <clears throat> and that's how that all came about. And then it was commercialized and St. Nicholas was, was actually created and finalized by the Coca-Cola Company. In the, 1923, I believe. I've got it here written down here somewhere. And uh, that's the origins of Christmas. And, and so we might wonder, uh, what, what uh, why should we, especially as uh, Native American Christians, be concerned about uh, the Christmas story? And in the uh, Feasting of the Word, 
Lewis Donaldson shares a little more insight on the origins of the Christmas story and how it relates into modern Christians. And he, he points out that, uh, and rightly so, that God made something good come from this horrific ritual that was being practiced in a culture of uh, predatory religious beliefs where uh, people felt that they were morally superior to others and had the right to inflict pain and suffering on others for their own personal gain, even to the point of murdering innocent people as a human sacrifice for their own personal gain. And so when we think about this, and we think about uh, why we are celebrating Christmas and, and how that was uh, changed, we also keep in mind that not everything in, about Christmas has been completely converted into something good. Today, here in North America, and this is a problem that's been around for a long time, it's become very commercialized, probably thanks to the Coca-Cola company. And, uh, and now that's what we celebrate for. But the main emphasis I want to think about in this sense is on Christmas Day, we do honor Jesus. And that is how God has made something good come from this horrific ritual, historical ritual. God turned this around. So instead of pain and suffering and murder being inflicted on people on December 25th, we have a time of joy, of families coming together in their highest point of dysfunction. And having an opportunity to come together to celebrate someone who lived a life devoted to helping improve the quality of life for all people. And to think about how that can be transformed into quality time with our friends and families. And so instead of just utterly rejecting Christmas as a pagan ritual as I've heard many conservative Christians talking about on the television and in other places, instead of just utterly rejecting Christmas because it is founded in a pagan ritual, that's to me the negative. That's taking away God's transformative power of taking something that human beings have distorted and perverted, which we tend to do quite often, turning it around and making something good come from it and honoring God's power and blessing in this and support for all human beings by making something good come from this. And that's how in our Indian religious tradition that we feel about Christmas. And in that sense, to talk about this a little more, <clears throat> one of my counterparts among the Ogallala Sioux, Floyd looks for a buffalo hand, he wrote his perspective on it. American Indian Christmas. And, uh, and he points out the historical information on it. Uh, and so uh, some of this is consistent with Cherokee understanding, some not, but the main, the main thing is, is that the transformative power of God has come to a place where, as he says, we already do celebrate the solstice time, which is near Christmas. The solstice is sacred to American Indians. And so it was not much of a step for American Indians to add to that celebration the honoring of Jesus on that day of the December 25th. Because we hold in our Indian religious tradition, American Indian elders and spiritual leaders, our Indian religious leaders, such as myself and many others, we hold Jesus in high regard. 
and worthy of being honored. Because he chose to give of himself that all the people may live. And how many of us can say that will be remembered about us in the generations to come? And we think about that at this time. And so we do believe that Christmas Day should be celebrated, that Jesus should be honored. But also, too, we think about the correlation, the connection, the common ground between that Christmas story among European Christians that came to North America and the modern translations and interpretations of it in conjunction with our Indian religious tradition. And Floyd Hand, he puts it really well. And I, uh, I actually wrote it down here or something, let me see. Oh, uh, here it is. I put this on Facebook last night, so you're going to hear this again. Traditional American Indians are raised to respect the Christian star and the birth of the first Indian spiritual leader. He was a star person and the avatar. His name was Jesus, Jesus. He was a Hebrew, a red man. He received his education from the wilderness. John the Baptist, Moses, and other excellent teachers that came before Jesus provided an educational foundation with the holistic method. Every day is our Christmas. Every meal we take, a little portion of the food that we are eating, and we offer it to the spirit world on behalf of the four-legged, the winged and the two legged. We pray, not the way most Christians pray, but we thank the grandfathers, the spirit and the guardian angel. The Indian culture is actually grounded in the traditions of a roving angel. The life ways of roving angels are actually the way Indian people live. They hold out their hands and help the sick and the needy. They feed and clothe the poor. We have high respect for the avatar because we believe that it is in giving that we receive. And there is much more here that uh, Floyd Looks for Buffalo Hand talks about. And I want to thank him for his doing in that way, writing that down, because that encapsulates American Indian celebration of Christmas and the reason that we set aside the origins of that story and we are not concerning ourselves of the birth of Jesus on that day when he was born. That's not as important as we remember him for how he lived his life. And in the story that we have here in Luke, we see that he is elevated as a person to be revered and honored. Just as in Psalm 96, is a song of praise to God, talking about the importance of honoring the sacredness of God and the sacredness of those who give of themselves that we may live. We have a responsibility, an obligation, each and every one of us, to make something good come from Christmas, the way that God has intended for something good to come from, create, from Christmas celebration. Though He walk cares about each and every one of us, cares about the quality of relationship that we have with not only with ourselves, but with each other, and the quality of relationship that we have with God. And it is God's intention to make something good come from all the many things that human beings have and continue to inflict.
inflict pain and suffering upon ourselves. We are good at that. Human beings are really good at that. And God wants to make something good come from those times that we do, but we have to have a willingness to participate that. And we do have a responsibility to remember Christmas is about reminding us of how God can and does make something good come from these times where human depravity and cruelty reign. And we have a choice to support God's intention in this or not. 